Inside this video right here, I'm gonna break down the normal vital signs for an adult patient. Here we go. Hey everyone, it's the Paramedic Coach here. If you're new here, my name is Evan, the Paramedic Coach. This is the number one channel in the world for everything EMS education. If you are new here, hit subscribe, tap the notification bell, and punch that like button for everybody watching this video right now. And we're diving in to vital signs for EMS, vital signs for the adult patient. And I'm gonna break down why these vital signs are so important so you understand this cold. Now, here we go. So the first piece that we have here that we're gonna talk about is the patient's blood pressure, all right? So I'm gonna put over on the side here as I'm talking through these different vital signs, some notes here for you on the side, okay? So first is blood pressure. The normal patient blood pressure that we're looking for is 120 over 80. Now, I'm gonna give you a few notes here to remember. Is 120 over 80 normal? Sure, yes, it's normal. Could you be 120 over 70 and is that okay? Yes, it's okay. Now here's the reason why I'm saying this to you. If we have a bottom number, which is the diastolic, the top number is systolic, the bottom number is diastolic, okay? So when we have a blood pressure, let's say it was 130 over 90, that's an, that is gonna be actually a high blood pressure on the top numbers, a little high. The bottom number is actually very high. So if I see a patient with a blood pressure of 120 over 70, they have some room to breathe. In some textbooks nowadays, they do say that 120 over 70 is normal. Others will say 120 over 80 is normal. So I'm gonna give you a range, okay? Now, 120 over 70, cool, that's cool with me. 120 over 80, that's cool with me too. Just know that, there's a lot of confusion out there. We've now cleared this up. Now, what's a really high blood pressure? Let's say a stroke patient might have a blood pressure of 200 over 100. A CHF patient in the early stages may have a blood pressure of 180 over 100, right? What about a patient who maybe is bleeding out or severely dehydrated? What might their number be? Or in a state called shock, okay? Well, that's called hypoperfusion. Hypo, not enough. Perfusion means, am I getting blood around my body? If I'm hypoperfused, my blood pressure is low. Okay, so the magic number is the systolic blood pressure of 90. I have all these organs in my body, right? We have a heart, we have a liver, right? Stomach, all the organs. If our blood pressure is not 90 systolic, then we are not getting enough blood to our organs. Now, some may say that, this is a basic video, oh, it's the mean arterial pressure of 60. Yes, that's correct too for my advanced people out there. But let's stick with the nice systolic rule for now, okay? If we see a blood pressure under nice systolic, we're not getting enough blood to our organs. That is a fact right there. Okay, so now we understand blood pressure normally in the adult land, let's move in to heart rate and pulse. When I say heart rate, you can see my heart monitor over here. This, if I was to hook a patient up to the EKG wires, EKG leads that you're gonna hear, okay, in, out in the field, and I show on the screen there, that's a heart rate. A pulse is something that you actually feel on the patient, okay? That's important to know, okay? They should be the same, but just so you're aware, Heart rate will be more on a screen. The pulse is something that you feel with your fingers, okay? So, when we're taking a pulse on a patient, there's two main points that I really like, okay? Now, you're gonna learn about the radial pulse, right? You're gonna learn the brachial pulse. You're gonna learn about the carotid pulse, the femoral pulse, all that stuff, okay? When you're taking a pulse on a patient, I wanna give you a practical tip. And then we're gonna go to numbers. Radial pulse on a lot of people is very easy to feel, okay? But sometimes, just for some reason, 
Just can't feel it. I've been there. Go, oh, I'm having a hard time finding this pulse. This pulse point right here is where you actually put the blood pressure cuff to hear your blood pressure. This pulse point right here, you can see the little ridge here and it comes up. Ridge and it comes up. Right here, put your fingers. You can do it on yourself. The pulse point is, it feels so much stronger and easier to feel here than it does here. You can still feel it, right? But you can feel the difference here. So if you're struggling to get a pulse on somebody, check here. My advice. Now the normal pulse in an average adult is 60 to 100, right? Now let's talk about some special circumstances with pulse and why it'd be high and why it'd be low. Now let's talk about some special circumstances with pulse. If we have someone who's an athlete, right, or they work out a lot, you'll notice their pulse can go below 60. It's not uncommon to find a pulse rate of 40 or 50 in people who work out a lot or athletes. Think about aerobics or weight training, you can find their pulse rate go down. That's not something to be scared of. But if you see somebody with a pulse rate of under 60, you should ask them, hey, can I ask you a question? I see your pulse here is 48. Um, do you run? Do you work out a lot? And they'll tell you. Is that normal for you? Has anyone ever told you that before? Remember, if they're in your ambulance, they're calling for an emergency. So you got to check this stuff out. Okay? Right. So now let's talk about if the pulse is too low for bad reasons. Well, there could be something called a heart block, which is an electrical problem inside your heart that can make the heart rate too low. And medications can overdoses can also make the heart rate too low as well. Now, reasons why the pulse rate would be too high, pain, fear, anxiety, infection, or exercise, right? Exercise meaning you're actually like working out right now, not at rest, okay? So if you're on the treadmill, your heart rate isn't 60, right? It's going to go up above 100. If you're in severe pain, your heart rate will be above 100, right? If you are have an infection, inflammation in your body, heart rate will go up, okay? Again, pain and anxiety are usually the most common. When we talk about a patient with a high heart rate, I think about two different lands. Roll me on this one. 100 to 150 is usually, it's pain, anxiety, infection. It's usually, you'll see a heart rate of 10, you know, let's say 102, 104, 120, right? If a heart rate becomes 140, 150, 160, especially over 150 plus, it's usually a primary heart problem that we're having. Something that I want you to remember when you get in the class. Okay, now let's move on and talk about respiratory rate. Now, respiratory rate in the adult patient means how many times your patient breathing in and out, breathing in and out when you're in front of them. A normal patient is going to breathe in and out between 12 and 20. If somebody is breathing under 12 breaths a minute, this is a true medical emergency, right? And we would need to help the patient with their ventilations. Ventilations meaning they need help getting oxygen, carbon dioxide out of their body. They're breathing at too low of a rate. A common test question will be, you approach an unresponsive patient with a respiratory rate of eight, what do you do? We need to help them ventilate, okay? Let's give you an example. Now, if somebody has a respiratory rate of over 20, then in that case, they're breathing very rapidly. Again, pain, anxiety, or some of the most common culprits, but some processes inside the body can cause you to breathe at a rapid rate. Okay, so you wanna keep that in mind as well as you're getting ready for school, 12 to 20 is normal. Now, the next thing I wanna talk about is pulse oximetry. With pulse oximetry, what you're seeing, it's a, it's a little probe as you'll put on the patient's finger, okay? Actually, in pediatrics, you can put it on their foot, just to give you an idea, but we try to do the uh, hand in most people like adults. So, 94 to 99% is going to be a normal range for pulse oximetry, okay? Now, what is pulse oximetry? It's also known as SpO2. It measures how well oxygen is actually combining and attaching to your red blood cells in your body how well basically you're absorbing oxygen, 
how is oxygen being absorbed into your body, good or bad? It's not uncommon to see a young pediatric, they could have 99 to 100% on a pulse oximetry, right? People who smoke, it's not uncommon. See their pulse oximetry, 95, 96, 94, right? Somebody with COPD or maybe a, a late stage heart condition may be 92, 93, 94%, and that's normal for them to live in that environment. And they're actually taking supplemental oxygen to make sure their oxygen levels are where they need to be at least above 94%, okay, in most cases with these patients. So that is your pulse oximetry. Now, there is a few more vital signs I want to talk to you about in this video. Two more, actually. The next one is blood glucose. Blood glucose, if we, a street nickname would be checking a blood sugar on a patient, right? The blood glucose level, the BGL level, is taken in patients. Maybe they're altered mental status. Maybe they're a, di a, a diabetic patient. Altered mental status means that man or woman is confused, okay? A normal blood glucose could be anywhere from 70 to about 120. It's kind of what we're looking for with blood glucose, right? In my experience, when a patient goes under 70, that's when we start seeing some funky behavior. Under 60, no matter what kind of diabetic you are, you usually start seeing some funky behavior. 30s and 40s, the patient's usually unresponsive on when you get there, okay? In my experience. A quick note about diabetics is every diabetic acts different. A diabetic could be at 60 and be unresponsive when someone else at 60 is still fine. Another one could be at 30 unresponsive and the other one at 30 is still fine. It's, but you need to know it's still low. It's still a low number, right? So we need to get them back to a normal number for that patient, okay? If we were to go to a patient and their blood glucose was, let's say, 210, uh, 3, 330, um, that would be hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia is too much. Hypo is too little. Remember this in medicine, if you didn't pick up on it already in this video, hypo is not enough of whatever I'm talking about. Hyper is too much of whatever I'm talking about, right? So that's something very, very important to remember. Now the last piece is gonna be N-tidal CO2. And for I have a video on N-tidal CO2, which I'll, I'll try to uh, link either above here or somewhere down below on N-tidal CO2 as I go over it for you. But with n tidal CO2, it stands for n tidal carbon dioxide. So it could be on the uh, breathing tube if the patient's intubated, which means it's a breathing tube in their trachea and you are ventilating the patient either via a ventilator or through a bag valve, okay? Now with n tidal CO2, we are measuring the n tidal carbon dioxide of the patient, right? So when they're breathing out that last bit, that's what we're measuring. So the normal n tidal CO2 number is 35 to 45. It can be too low, it can be too high. 35 to 45 is a sweet spot where we wanna be with our patients. Now n tidal CO2 is important in a variety of patients. Respiratory patients, we can see a lot with n tidal CO2, again, on this heart monitor, we can see a lot going on there. And then the other thing as well, NTEL CO2, is confirmation that we've actually intubated the patient correctly. Because if we don't have a carbon dioxide number when we place a breathing tube, the breathing tube might be in the stomach, which is in the wrong place, okay? So those are, are all the main numbers and vials that you need to know. We went through them all, blood pressure, respiratory rate, pulse, blood glucose, pulse oximetry, antile CO2. Make sure you have these down cold before you answer EMT class, and man, it's gonna be a lot easier for you. Now, vital signs is one piece, one little piece of you becoming an EMT. I've actually created an entire video series you can pick up right here online and get it now, and actually give you a lifetime access to this entire prep course. So if you're somebody right now getting ready for EMT, advanced EMT, or paramedic school, or you are somebody getting ready for national registry, that national registry prep is in there as well, click the link down below. I'll give you a lifetime access to the program you see right here on the screen. And my friends, I will see you in the next video. I'll see you there. Take care. 
don't waste any time. Don't don't be hesitant and just do it because I know this program works. And I know it's it got me to where it was, where it's been a year without school from EMT to, hey, I passed my test in 70 questions. Like, go for it. You could do it. Like, do not hesitate and don't waste any time. People that don't know you, they need to. They need this program. This program is not a, a choice. To me, this program is a have to. Take uh, uh, thousands and thousands of pages in the books and you just narrow it down and just make everything simple to pass the registry. So uh, it's, it's, it's great content, man. I promise you it's worth it. Took this with three weeks left to go in my class and I just, I'm not sure if I would have been able to pass my course or the NREMT first try without this course. The fact like when I was taking the, the national and I would read the question and I, I would be like, whoa, Evan literally just went over this in the car. So it's, it really, it helps. I got to the point where I was just ready to spill all my knowledge onto this freaking test. So I'm like, you know what, man, just go ahead, go for it. Open it up, boom, congratulations, you passed. It was um, outside of having my children, man, it's probably the, more like the happiest day of my life, bro, to be honest with you.